Hello. Hello and a good whatever the time is for you there. As you might know from this luscious voice, it's me, Ferris, and I'll be handling on the development and maturation of the lung. So, let's begin! Do note that this process begins in the fourth week of gastrulation. Our respiratory tract originated from our foregut, which is essentially the primordial GI tract. <laughs> well, don't forget about it. <laughs> anyway, the respiratory diverticulum, or the primordial respiratory tract, will elongate to produce two lateral outpouching, or primary bronchi. While all of this were occurring, the respiratory tract will begin to be separate itself from the foregut. Now, what might happen to the two while poaching? Well, my curious medical colleagues, the primary bronchi would first branch off into secondary bronchi, which will further form a sub sub branch, which includes segmental, intersegmental, and lobar. Once we've reached the 24th week, we will have 70 branches of respiratory bronchials ready for their duty. Now, we've covered about how our sweet young lung finally grows so big. Now we need to undergo a maturation stage, but for that, we will need to go into the histology side of anatomy. There's four main stages involved. The first one, the pseudoglandular stage. In this stage, as the name suggested, it acts similar to exocrine glands, but it's not exocrine gland. Ish. Seems like the lung going through it wanna be someone stage. <laughs> Teenagers, am I right? Next, the canalicular stage. What happened is the bronchi would increase in its lemon size and the amount of blood capillary surrounding it. Oh, ain't that cute? It's making more and more friends. Third, terminal sac stage. A very direct stage. It only involves the increased number in terminal sac developing and the epithelial line is thinning. This is you must know, as it is a major stage where blood air barrier establishes. Blood air barrier is in, in layman term. It's just a contact between alveoli and capillary thanks to their respective epithelial line. Now the final stage the alveolar stage. The alveolar has finally matured. After all this affecting the sweat out of the lung, he has finally graduated. I'm so proud. Assalamu alaikum and hello everyone. My name is Nur Shahira Binti Muhammad Azmi. On the second TLO, I will discuss the cause of respiratory distress in infants, while my group mate will explain the cause of respiratory distress in adults. Respiratory distress syndrome RDS, is also known as hyaline membrane disease, and it affects around 2% of live newborn infants that are delivered prematurely. Shortly after delivery, infants with this respiratory distress syndrome will experience fast and labored breathing. Many factors contribute to this RDS in infants, including surfactant deficiency, pulmonary alix disorder such as pneumothorax, neonatal pneumonia, and interstitial lung disorder. However, we will focus on the most common cause of RDS in infants, 
which is surfactant deficiency. Firstly, let's go through what surfactant is. Surfactant is a detergent-like complex that reduces surface tension and aids in the prevention of alveolar collapse, or we can call it as atelectasis. Surfactant is produced between weeks 20 to 22 and reach a significant level by weeks 34. Premature newborn produce less surfactant and it does not reach an adequate level, resulting in surfactant deficiency, thus leading to RDS. Next, the risk factor that can lead to surfactant deficiency. There are several risk factors that can cause surfactant deficiency and might be primary or secondary. Some of the primary factors are prematurity, which refers to infants that are born prematurely, low birth weight infants, and maternal diabetes in the mother during pregnancy. Secondary factors include race, gender, late preterm birth, prenatal hypoxia and ischemia, as well as delivery outside of the lab bedroom. Surfactant deficiency can occur in both preterms and terms infants. However, it is more frequent in preterm infants and it occurs rarely in term infants. Surfactant deficiency can occur in premature infants due to long immaturity and insufficient surfactant production. In term infants, exposed to the factor that can delay surfactant production and dysfunctional surfactant arising from genetic formation can lead to surfactant deficiency. That's all from me. Thank you. Hi, I am Iza Sakina and I will be explaining the respiratory distress in adults. Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome ARDS. The mechanical cause of ARDS is fluid leak from the smaller blood vessels in the lungs into the tiny air sacs where the blood is oxygenated. Normally, a protective membrane keeps this fluid in the vessel, however, severe illness or injury can cause damage to the membrane leading to an inflammation hence forming ARDS. Causes of ARDS are very diverse and here are some diseases that can lead to ARDS. Firstly, sepsis which is body's extreme response to an infection. At the cellular level, sepsis induces inflammatory cells damage the alveolar capillaries and the epithelial cells causing diffuse alveolar damage and acute pulmonary edema by altering the vascular permeability and resulting in the acidative phase of ARDS. They will increase the breathing difficulty and need to be assisted by a ventilation. Secondly, pneumonia. ARDS and pneumonia are closely correlated in the critically ill patient. Pneumonia are resulted from inflammation due to bacterial or viral infection whereas ARDS happens when fluid from nearby blood vessels to leak in the tiny air sac in your lungs. A patient that has pneumonia can have the complication of having ARDS. Last but not least, acute pancreatitis. With severe pancreatitis, there are a lot of inflammatory chemicals that are secreted into the bloodstream. These chemicals create inflammation throughout the body, including the lungs, hence the severe form of it is ARDS. Hello and Assalamualaikum. My name is Nur Fatini binti Abdul Malik Marwan. Today, I'm going to present about TL TLO number 3. The first disease related to respiratory distress is tracheoesophageal fistula or in short TF. So, what is TF? TF is an abnormal connection between esophagus and trachea. TF is a very common cognition anomaly seen in major pediatric surgery. So, how TF occur? Okay, allow me to explain it. TF occur due to abnormal septation of caudal foregut during 4th and 5th week of embryonic development. The normal embryonic development is the trachea form as a diverticulum of the foregut and develop a complete septum that separated from esophagus. As you can see in the picture, the blue color is the trachea and the yellow is esophagus. And in the middle, we are the tracheoesophagus septum that separate both esophagus and trachea. So, as I said, the cause of TF is the trachea and esophagus that develop from common primitive foregut at approximate 4th 
weeks of gestation is abnormal. The forecut is divided into a ventral respiratory tract and a dorsoesophagus tract. The fistula tract is thought to derive from an embryonic lung bud that fails to undergo branching. This TF defect of mesenchymal proliferation is thought to lead to TF formation. Infants with TF classically present with respiratory tract distress, feeding difficulty, choking, and risk of aspiration. Next, let's move to the type of TF. There are five types of TF. Before we jump to the type, let me explain to you the difference between fistula and artesia. Okay, let me make it simple for you to understand. Esophageal artesia is based on its name. It occurs only at esophagus. So, artesia is when esophagus have two segments, which means it's not formed one tube perfectly. Why the esophageal fistula is an abnormal connection between esophagus and trachea. Okay, are you with me? I hope so. Okay, back to my objective, the type of DF. Let's start with type E. As you can see at the picture above, type A only has artesia. This is commonly referred to as pure esophageal artesia. It makes up about 8% of all cases. Why type B is a combination of artesia and fistula, but it's a little bit different from type C. I'm going to talk about it later. So let's move along. Um, type B is a very rare to find this case. It's only about 1-4% to of all cases. Type C is the most common form of TF. Type C is occur when the upper portion of the esophagus ends in the blind punch and the lower portion is connected to your trachea by the tra tracheoesophageal fistula. So, you can see the difference between type B and type C, right? So, I don't need to explain about it. Okay, fine. I'm going to explain about it. I can see your faces. So, bear with me. Okay, basically, it's the way of esophagus is connected with the trachea. Type B is the upper portion of esophagus connected to the trachea, while type C is the lower portion connected with the trachea. Next, type D is the both the upper and lower portion is connected to the trachea with the presence of artesia. This type is also case rare cases. Okay, and lastly, the type E. There is no artesia, so the esophagus fully form a tube, but there is tracheal esophageal fistula which is affect about 4% of the F cases. I think that's it from me. Thank you. Alright, thank you Fatini. Now, my name is Iman Iskandar. I'm going to talk about another disorder which is congenital diaphragmatic hernia. In other words, it is abnormal formation of diaphragm. So, CDH is one of the most common major congenital anomalies occurring in one of every 3,000 live births in which it can occur on the left or right side of diaphragm. However, it's very rare for it to happen on both sides. Moving on, a congenital condition known as a diaphragmatic hernia, which I mentioned earlier, it is an abnormal formation of diaphragm in which the embryo fails to form a complete diaphragm during gestation period. And as a result, a hole is seen on the diaphragm. This will allow the abnormal organs to enter the thoracic cavity through the hole on the diaphragm. The presence of these abdominal organs in the chest limits the space for the lungs and can result in respira respiratory complication. And this is due to CDH forces the lungs to grow in a compressed state. Hence, it would impact the growth and development of the lungs. The lungs will be smaller than expected, or in other words, pulmonary hypoplasia which lungs are, lungs are small in size and will have less developed blood, blood vessel. This causes high blood pressure in the lungs. In other words, it is pulmonary hypertension. Furthermore, on the formation of the diaphragm, embryologically speaking, as you can refer the diagram on the bottom left of the screen, the diaphragm is derived from four embryonic structures. The first one, Septum transversum forms at week 4 of gestation as an incomplete diaphragm centrally separating the pleural and peritoneal cavities. It also develops into the central tendon of the diaphragm. At week 5 of gestation, pleuroperitoneal membranes 
form lateral to the central tendon on both right and left side of diaphragm. They fuse with the septum transversum and the mesentery of the esophagus to complete the partition between the pleural and peritoneal cavities. Normally, the right side would fuse first while the left side fuses later. This would be um, the possible reason on why in most CDH cases are left-sided. As you can see, the baby on the, uh, on the screen is also left-sided. And then we have dorsal mesentery of the esophagus develops into the diaphragmatic pleura. Last one is mesoderm of the body wall forms the peripheral rim of the diaphragm. To sum up, by week 10 of gestation, the diaphragm is fully developed in a developing embryo. However, in cases of CDH, the process that leads to formation of the diaphragm is disrupted. Abdominal contents can enter the thoracic cavity once the diaphragm has a hole in it and is known as herniation. Because fatal activity and breathing movement become more frequent and vigorous as pregnancy continues, the amount of herniation can fluctuate or increase. Okay, moving forward to types of congenital diaphragmatic hernia. As you can see on the left part of the screen, the types of CDH is consists of posterolateral hernia or boctalic hernia happen to be the most common diaphragmatic hernia which often accompanied by herniation of the stomach, intestine, liver, and sometimes spleen into the thoracic cavity. Boctalic hernia consists of three sides where the defect can be formed which are bilateral, right and left side of diaphragm, in which about 85% of boctalic hernias occur on the left side due to the formation of diaphragm like I mentioned earlier, and 13% on the right while two on bilateral. Follow up with anterior restronal hernia or mogagni hernia which can result with the herniation of liver or intestine into thoracic cavity and can be seen approximately 23% of all CDH cases. Lastly, central hernia which is the rare diaphragm defect in which the hole is formed on the central tendinous portion of the diaphragm while the rim of diaphragmatic musculature is present. That is all from me, thank you. TLO4, describe the biochemical composition of the surfactant. So before I get into the biochemical composition, I would like to take a little bit of time to describe what the surfactant is and what does it do. So, what is the lung surfactant? The lung surfactant is a complex of phospholipids and proteins that reduces the surface tension on the lungs and prevents the collapse of alveoli. The surfactant is secreted by type 2 alveolar cells, which can be found in the lungs. The lung surfactant is made up of 80% of phosphatidylcholine, 10% neutral lipids such as cholesterol, and 10% of surfactant proteins A, B, C, and D. This is just a visual representative of the biochemical composition in the lung surfactant, and you can see that phosphatidylcholine makes up the majority of the surfactant with the total amount of 80%. And you can find multiple kinds of phosphatidylcholine inside the surfactant. And one of the more prominent ones would be dipalmitoylecithin, which I will discuss a little bit further uh, right after this slide. But besides dipalmitoylecithin, we also have phosphatidylglycerol, phosphatidylinositol, phosphatidylserine, and finally phosphatidylethanolamine. And then after that, we have neutral lipids, which is about 10% of the lung surfactant. This is comprised of things such as cholesterol, sphingomyelin, and other unmentioned lipids. And finally, we also have the surfactant proteins A, B, C, and D. And this makes up 10% of the lung surfactant, just like the neutral lipids. So moving on to the dipalmatoylecithin. And dipalmatoylecithin is a type of phosphatidylcholine which happens to be the main component of the lung surfactant. Besides carrying out the typical functions of a lung surfactant, such as reducing surface tension in the lungs, as well as preventing alveolar collapse, the dipalmatoylecithin is actually also used to calculate the LS ratio, which would be the lecithin-sphingomyelin ratio in its full name. 
the LS ratio can be used to determine fetal lung maturity and it's also used to detect and possibly prevent complications such as respiratory distress syndrome in the fetus. So the fetal lung maturity, uh, before we go on, the fetal lung maturity actually refers to the uh, fetus's lung's ability to produce uh, enough surfactant to support the lungs. So the normal LS ratio is greater or equal to 2 to 1. And this ratio indicates mature fetus lungs. What this means is that the fetus's lungs are mature, it can produce enough surfactant in order to support the lung in its functions. And then finally, we have the abnormal LS ratios. So there are two types of ratios. The first one would be the ratio under 1.5 to 1. And this ratio means that the fetus lungs are immature. And this means that the fetus can't actually produce adequate surfactant in order to support the lungs. So if this fetus were to be born, and this can usually be seen in fetuses born prematurely, uh, the infant would suffer breathing problems and complications such as the aforementioned respiratory distress syndrome. Our second ratio would be ratios in the range of 1.5 to 1 to 1.9 to 1. This signifies a, a high risk of immature fetal lungs and if this fetus were to be born, it might cause breathing problems or it might give rise to complications such as the respiratory distress syndrome. So for this Tech Level 5, we will explain about the role of phospholipids and proteins of surfactant in normal alveoli. There are many types of phospholipid that contain in the surfactant. And one of those is dipalmitol phosphatidylcholine or known as DPPC. It consists of two palmitic acid groups which is a 16 carbon saturated fatty acid where it is attached to a phosphatidylcholine head group. The phosphatidylcholine composed of a choline head group and a glycerophosphoric acid. This type of phospholipid is very important because it is the main constituent or the major component of pulmonary surfactant which reduce surface tension, reduce the hold of breathing, and prevent alveolar collapse during breathing. The choline radical constitutes the polar hydrophilic head. The palmitic acid chains form the non-polar hydrophobic tails, while DDPPC itself already has the ability to reduce the surface tension of the alveolar liquid. The proteins and other lipids in the surfactant further facilitate the absorption of oxygen into the air liquid interface. Cholesterol is the major component of the neutral lipid. This sterol could add as a fluidizer to enhance the absorption and respiring of DPPC. Before we go to the explanation how the phospholipid play its role in reducing the surface tension, firstly we have to know how the surface tension itself is developed. So what you can see here is the lining fluid of interior alveolar wall where inside the wall they have the air, they have the water and they also have the air-water interface. There are water molecules deep inside the lining of the fluid and there's also water molecule on the surface of the lining fluid. All of these water molecules attract each other. Molecules deep inside the bulb are attracted equally in all the direction. So it means no net force acting on them. However, water molecules on surface do not have any other water molecules upwards to pull them. So they experience net pull downwards by water molecules in the bulk. This net force pulls water molecules deep in. And kind of vacuum are created on the surface. As they dive deep, the water molecules that stay on the surface develop pull towards such vacuum areas. This put them in state of tension which is called surface tension. So this is how surface tension develops. Now we go to how phospholipid reduce surface tension. So how the palmitol phosphatidylcholine reduces surface tension is based on the amphiphatic nature of the phospholipid molecules. The DPPC molecules align themselves on the alveolar surface. The polar hydrophilic head it is oriented towards and extends into the alveolar liquid. The non-polar hydrophobic tails they are oriented towards the outer side. The hydrophobic portion attracted by the polar molecules of the liquid. 
and the hydrophilic portion still fell against the water. Due to charge moiety, the water soluble heat is attracted by surrounding water molecules. The hydrophobic tail pulls the surfactant molecules upward away from water. As it occupies this area surface, density of water molecules on the surface decreases. The lesser the water molecule on the surface, the lesser the surface tension. The heat attracts the water molecules near the surface. This attraction opposes the downward pull on these water molecules. Surfactant molecule is prevented from going deep by hydrophobic tail. If you look at the green rectangular line, you can see that the downward pull on the water molecule is lesser as compared to that without surfactant. The surfactant reduces the tendency of surface molecules to dive deep in bulk water. This results in reduced surface tension. The more the surfactant molecules on the surface, the lesser the surface tension. Thus, the easier it is to expand the lung. In terms of compliance, surfactant molecule increases compliance of lungs. So, this is the end of the explanation of how phospholipid play its role in reducing the surface tension. Moving on to the role of proteins in pulmonary surfactant. As discussed earlier, pulmonary surfactant generally composed of 90% lipids and 10% proteins. Both of these combined in pulmonary surfactant is responsible in lowering surface tension in lungs. Focusing on surfactant protein, or can be shortened as SP, there are four surfactant proteins present, which are SPA, SPB, SPC, and SPD. These proteins are further classified into hydrophilic proteins, which are SPA and SPD, and hydrophobic proteins, which are SPB and SPC. Firstly, we will discuss on the role of hydrophilic proteins, which are SPA and SPD. Both of these proteins have a very close related structures and both are the members of a family of innate proteins, which are also called as collectins. In pulmonary surfactant, SPA is the most abundant protein followed by SPB, while SPD is the least in composition. The main role of both SPA and SPD are host defense. This can be done by inhibiting bacterial growth, facilitating bacterial uptake by host cells, and aggregating and opsonizing pathogens. For individual functions, SPA play an important role in the structure of the surfactant extracellular form and other surfactant-related functions. Meanwhile, for SPD, it mainly functions in surfactant homeostasis. For this hydrophilic protein's deficiency, there are no specific studies in humans that can support this role of proteins in infants with respiratory distress. But however, in animal studies, there are suggesting an association or prediction for lung inflammation and infection. Next, for the role of hydrophobic proteins, which are SPB and SPC, both proteins are stored and secreted together with TPPC in order to confer surface tension lowering properties. Mainly, SPB function in enhancing the surface tension reducing properties. However, for SPC, their role in pulmonary surfactant are uncertain. But generally, it also promotes the formation of phospholipid film lining in alveolus. If there is mutation on SPB gene in infants, they may suffer from severe respiratory failure that is very little in the perinatal period. Meanwhile, SPC deficiency do not bring rise to any respiratory distress at birth, but the child may develop interstitial pulmonary fibrosis in early childhood. Hello, I am Tracyka and this video is edited by Noor Ayn. Now let's talk about the functions of surfactants. The first function is to improve lung compliance, the second is to prevent fluid accumulation, and the third is to stabilize the size of alveoli. Now let's look into the first function which is increased compliance of lung. This is the lung parenchyma and this is the alveoli. Now if we zoom in and take a look at the alveoli, there will be a layer of fluid in the wall of the alveoli. Now the surface tension of this fluid tends to collapse the alveoli. To expand the alveoli, we need extra efforts by respiratory muscles to overcome this surface tension. The more the surface tension, the harder it is to expand the alveoli. 
surfactants decrease surface tension and decrease the tendency of alveoli to collapse. So less force is required to expand the alveoli. Thus, in presence of surfactants, it becomes easy to expand the alveoli. Or in fancy words, the compliance of lungs increases. It also decreases the work of breathing. Now, let's look into the second function, which is preventing fluid accumulation in alveoli. Again, the high surface tension without surfactants tends to collapse the liquid in the alveoli. As it collapses, it draws fluid from the interstitium to the alveoli. This increases thickness of liquid layer and makes it difficult for gases to diffuse. And once again, surfactants decrease surface tension, prevent this from happening. Now, third function, stabilizing size of alveoli. In absence of surfactants, small alveoli collapse into large alveoli. We will study how surfactants stabilize the size under three questions. Why small alveoli collapse into large alveoli, why this should not happen, and how surfactants prevent this. First, why this happen? Let's say we have two alveoli with same size at the end of the inspiration and both are lined with fluid. The surface tension of the fluid is increasing pressure on the air in the alveoli. At this point, surface tension, radius, and pressure are all equal for both the alveoli. Now, let's say this alveoli has an obstruction in the airway. It increases resistance to airflow to this alveoli as compared to the other one. During expiration, both the alveoli will start collapsing. Due to the high resistance, this alveoli collapses more slowly. As the alveoli has no resistance, it collapses rapidly. Because of this, the size of both the alveoli is no longer equal. Now, let's see the Laplace equation for both the alveoli. In this alveoli, radius is comparatively small, so pressure generated is higher. Whereas in this alveoli, the radius is larger, so pressure will be comparatively less. We know that air moves from high pressure to low pressure. So here, the air will move from small alveoli to the large alveoli. And this result in collapse of smaller alveoli into the larger alveoli. This answers our first question, why small alveoli collapse into large alveoli in absence of surfactants. And now for the second question, why this should not happen. The answer is to maintain alveolar surface area for gas exchange. Total surface area of the same size alveoli is more as compared to the surface area of this non-uniformly sized alveoli. This decrease in surface area impairs gas exchange. So, it is important to prevent such collapse and stabilize the size of alveoli. Let's complete the second question as well. Now, let's see how surfactants prevent the collapse of smaller alveoli into the larger one. Again, we have those same alveoli with same size at the end of the inspiration. But this time, they both have surfactants in the alveolar fluid. At this point, density of surfactants on the surface is equal in both alveoli. So, the surface tension is also equal. As alveoli collapse during expiration, density of surfactants increase. This results in decrease in surface tension in both alveoli. Now, look at this alveoli. Radius of this alveoli is comparatively small. However, the smaller size also results in higher density of surfactants on the surface. So, there is greater fall in surface tension in this alveoli. And the final result is not much change in the pressure. Now, this alveoli is bigger in size, so the density of surfactants is less. Hence, the surface tension is comparatively higher. And again, the final result is minimal change in pressure. Thus, the adjustment in surface tension keeps the pressure in both the alveoli equal. So, there is no air movement and collapsing of one alveoli into the other is prevented. This adjustment in surface tension is possible only because of surfactants. This is how surfactants stabilize size of alveoli. That completes all three functions and the video. Hello, 
My name is Sapita Sri Turish. Today, in this yellow, I'm going to present about respiratory distress in infants, which is newborn respiratory distress syndrome, also known as NRDS. So, what is NRDS? Newborn respiratory distress syndrome. NRDS, which also known as hyaline membrane disease or surfactant deficiency lung disease, is a lung condition causing breathing problems in newborn premature infants. Respiratory distress syndrome in newborn happens when a baby's lungs are not fully developed and cannot provide enough oxygen, causing breathing difficulties. NRDS occurs when there is not enough of a substance in the lungs called surfactant. So, what is surfactant? Everyone should already know about surfactant. So, it made by the cells in the airways and consists of phospholipids and proteins. This keeps the airways or alveoli open, allowing the infants to breathe. So, what does surfactant do in this newborn respiratory distress syndrome? In healthy lungs, surfactant is released into the lungs tissues, where it helps to lower the surface tension in the airways, which helps keep the lung alveoli open. When there is not enough surfactant, the tiny alveoli collapse with each breath. As the alveoli collapse, damaged cells collect in the airways which makes it even harder to breathe. These cells are called hyaline membranes. The baby works harder and harder at breathing, trying to reinflate the collapsed airways. As the baby's lung function decreases, less oxygen is taken in and more carbon dioxide builds up in the blood. This can lead to acidosis, which is increased acid in the blood, a condition that can affect other body organs. Without any treatment, the baby becomes exhausted trying to breathe and eventually gives up. A mechanical ventilator must do the work of breathing instead. So, what are the factors that increase the risk of NRDS other than the deficiency of surfactant? First, a brother or sister who had newborn respiratory distress syndrome. Second, a mother who has diabetes. Third, caesarean delivery or induction of labor before the baby is full term. Fourth, problems with delivery that reduce the blood flow to the baby. Fifth, multiple pregnancy which is twins or more. And lastly, the rapid labor. So now we are going to talk about symptoms of NRDS. Most of the time, NRDS symptoms appear within minutes of birth. However, they may not be seen for several hours. While each baby may experience symptoms differently, some of the most common symptoms of newborn respiratory distress syndrome include first, rapid breathing very soon after birth, second, changes in color of lips, fingers and toes, third, grunting sound with each breath, fourth, flaring or widening of the nostrils, and fifth, chest retraction which is skin over the breastbone and ribs put in during breathing. Now we are going to talk about diagnosis of NRDS. The following tests are used to detect respiratory distress syndrome in the babies. First, blood gas analysis. It will show low oxygen and excess acid in the body fluids. Secondly, chest x-rays. It will show a ground glass appearance to the lungs is typical of the disease. This often develops 6 to 12 hours after birth. Third, a physical examination. Fourth, a pulse oximetry test. This test to measure how much oxygen is in the baby's blood using a sensor attached to their fingertip, ear and toe. Lastly, I'm going to talk about the complications of NRDS. First, air leaks. Air leaks out of the baby's lungs and become trapped in their chest cavity, which is pneumothorax. Second, air leaks into the mediastinum, the space between the two pleural sacs containing the lungs, which is pneumomediastinum. Third, air leaks into the area between the heart and the thin sac that surrounds the heart, pneumopericardium, and air leaks and becomes trapped between the alveoli, the tiny air sacs of the lungs, which is pulmonary interstitial emphysema. Then, secondly, internal bleeding. Babies with NRDS may have bleeding inside their lungs and brain, which is pulmonary hemorrhage and cerebral hemorrhage. And lastly, developmental 
disabilities if the baby's brain is damaged during nrds either because of bleeding or lack of oxygen it can lead to long-term development disabilities such as learning difficulties movement problems impaired hearing and impaired vision hello everyone i'm divya here today i'm going to talk about surfactant deficiency that cause respiratory distress in adults Pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is one of the respiratory diseases due to abnormal surfactant condition. In the picture, we can differentiate among a normal person's alveoli with the alveoli of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis patient. Here you all can see a buildup of protein surfactant inside the alveoli. Pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, which is also called as PAP, is a rare lung disorder characterized by an abnormal accumulation of surfactant derived lipoprotein compound within the alveoli of the lung. The accumulated substance interfere with the normal gas exchange and expansion of the lung, ultimately leading to difficulty in breathing and a predisposition to developing lung infection. These are the different types of the pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. Autoimmune pulmonary alveolar proteinosis APAP this type is the most common and is believed to represent about 90% of adults who get it these adults are mostly between the age of 30 and 60 years old secondary PAP this type is a result of having another type of disease or condition or of being exposed to a toxin congenital there is a form of PAP that happens because of genetic defects passed down to families subdivision of PAP are three which are primary PAP that divided into autoimmune PAP and hereditary PAP then secondary PAP and congenital PAP Let's see the causes of each subdivision of PAP. Primary PAP caused by reduced GM-CSF stimulation of alveolar macrophages which reduces the ability to remove surfactant from alveoli and results in surfactant buildup and breathlessness. Since GM-CSF is also necessary to help alveolar macrophages and white blood cells kill and remove bacteria and viruses loss of gmcsf stimulation can also result in secondary infections primary pap includes two diseases which are autoimmune pap and hereditary pap autoimmune pap the body's immune cells begin making a protein called gmcsf autoantibody that attacks the gmcsf and block its ability to stimulate alveolar macrophages Why it is known how GM-CSF autoantibodies cause diseases? It is not known what causes the disease to start. However, PAP occurs more commonly in smokers suggesting cigarette smoke is a trigger for the disease. In hereditary PAP, individuals are born with genetic mutation that destroy the function of protein on alveolar macrophage that interact with GM-CSF. The loss of GM-CSF receptor function blocks the ability of GM-CSF to stimulate alveolar macrophages. Hereditary PAP is a recessive genetic disorder determined by inheritance of traits from each parent. Here the trait specific characteristic is abnormal GM-CSF receptor function caused by presence of specific gene mutation. In secondary PAP Underlying disease or clinical condition causes a reduction in the number of alveolar macrophages which in return result in the build up of surfactant in alveolar and breathlessness many diseases or toxic substances exposures are associated with secondary PAP in congenital PAP the clinical presentation depend on which genetic mutation is present it can vary from respiratory failure at birth to slow development of lung sparing in children adolescents or adults symptoms can include rapid breathing difficulty gaining weight and fever this is usually an indication that infection is present the natural history or the poorly studied may involve worsening of disease over time and progression to respiratory failure at various ages 
depending on the specific gene involved and mutation present. What are the symptoms of pulmonary alveolar proteinosis? Shortness of breath, chest pain or tightness, fever, weight loss, cough, low level of oxygen in the blood, and knee clubbing. Affected people While the frequency of diseases causing PAP in the general population is not well studied, it is thought that autoimmune PAP accounts for 85 to 90% of all cases. Hereditary PAP, secondary PAP and congenital PAP each account for roughly 5%. Autoimmune PAP occurs in 6 to 7 people per million individuals in the general population. It most commonly presents in adult of 30 to 40 years of age but can occur in children as young as 3 years old. It is more common in men because more men smoke. Hereditary PAP usually present in children less than 10 years old but can present in adult as old as 35 years. How is pulmonary alveolar proteinosis diagnosed? If your doctor suspects PAP, he or she will first examine you. If you have PAP, your doctor might hear a crackling sound when he listens to your lungs. Other tests including blood test and pulmonary function test that measure how well your lungs are working, imaging test including chest x-rays or high resolution computer thermography scans, bronchoscopy a test that uses a thin scope to look into your airways, transbronchial biopsy a less invasive way of using bronchoscope to test tissue or fluid from the lungs for further testing, open surgical lung biopsy a test that removes tissue from the lungs to examine under microscope. How is pulmonary alveolar proteinosis treated? Whole lung levage Whole lung levage is a very specific procedure that uses saline solution to wash out the lungs. Hi, my name is Zain Zini. I will continue for TLO6 and I will explain briefly about acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is ARDS. Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome ARDS, is a life-threatening condition characterized by poor oxygenation and non-compliant or stiff lungs. There are two types of ARDS, which are directly ARDS and indirectly ARDS. Symptoms of ARDS Severe shortness of breath, labored and unusually rapid breathing, low blood pressure, and confusion and extreme tiredness. Causes of ARDS ARDS is a leakage of fluid from the smallest blood vessels in the lungs into the tiny air sacs where the blood is oxygenated. Usually, a protective membrane keeps this fluid in the vessels. However, severe illness and injury can cause damage to the membrane, leading to the fluid leakage of ARDS. The example of causes of ARDS, the first one is sepsis. Sepsis is the most common cause of ARDS and a serious and widespread infection of the bloodstream. Sepsis is one of the example of indirectly ARDS. The second one is inhalation of harmful substances. Breathing high concentrations of smoke or chemical fumes can result in ARDS as it can inhaling or aspirating vomit or near drowning episodes. Inhalation of harmful substances is the example of directly ARDS. The next one is severe pneumonia. Severe cases of pneumonia usually affect all five lobes of the lung. Head, chest or other major injury is, are also one of the causes of ARDS. The accidents such as falls or car crashes can directly damage the lungs or the portion of the brain that controls breathing. The next one is COVID-19, people who have severe COVID-19 may develop ARDS. That's why many patients of COVID-19 may experience shortness of breath. The other causes of ARDS is pancreatitis, which is the inflammation of the pancreas, massive blood transfusions, and burns. Complications of ARDS Blood clots Blood clots usually happens to the patients that lying still in the hospital while 
while they are on a ventilator that can increase the risk of developing blood clots, particularly in the deep veins in the legs. If a clot forms in the leg, a portion of it can break off and travel to one or both of the lungs which is pulmonary embolism. The next complication is pneumothorax. Pneumothorax For the treatment of pneumothorax, a breathing machine called a ventilator is used to increase oxygen in the body and force fluid out of the lungs. However, the pressure and air volume of the ventilator can force gas to go through a small hole in the very outside of a lung and cause the lung to collapse. The next complication is infections. Because the ventilator is attached directly to a tube inserted in the, wind, in the windpipe, this makes it much more easier for germs to infect and further injure the lungs. Scarring or pulmonary fibrosis is also one of the complications of ARDS. Scarring and thickening of the tissue between the air sac can occur within a few weeks of the onset of ARDS. This will stiffen the lungs, make it even more difficult for oxygen to flow from the air sacs into the bloodstream. The last one is breathing problems. Many people with ARDS will recover most of their lung function within several months to two years. For treatment of ARDS, it is very important to improve the levels of oxygen in the patient's blood. Based on the diagram, there are many types of treatment of ARDS, which are recruitment maneuvers, higher positive and aspiratory pressure, which is high PEEP, pulmonary vasodilators, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, renal replacement therapy, glucocorticoids, neuromuscular blockade, and prone positioning. So these are the, um, so these are the example of treatment of ARDS. The first one is the treatment by using oxygen. Supplemental oxygen is usually used for milder symptoms or as a temporary measure. Oxygen may be delivered through a mask that fits tightly over the nose and mouth. The second one is mechanical ventilation. Mechanical ventilation is used for the most people with ARDS because it will need the help of a machine to breathe. A mechanical ventilator pushes air into the lungs and forces some of the fluid out of the air sacs. The next one is the fluid treatment for ARDS. Carefully managing the amount of intravenous fluids is very crucial and important. Too much fluid can increase fluid build up in the lungs, while too little fluid can put a strain on the heart and other organs and lead to shock. The last treatment of ARDS is medication. Medication is used for to prevent and treat infections. Medications are also used for relief pain and discomfort, prevent blood clots in the legs and lungs, minimize gastric reflux, and act as a sedate.